So we we'll start to talk about packet pacing or rate limit for TCP or UDP flow. I'm pretty new here, so I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Oded Shanun. I'm from Israel. I work with Mellanox Technologies. My title is Software Manager. Only three years of FreeBSD. Consider myself a rookie. I am a rookie. Got my first degree at Tel Aviv University in computer science. <coughs> I was also an officer in the Israeli Air Force, like most Israelis. We have a long affair with the Army. And I love soccer. The Euro Championship just started. I think the first game is in one hour and I'm missing it. Fra <coughs> France against Romania. Uh, it's soccer. It's not oh, football. It's no, no, that's soccer. Not this year. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're from Germany, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's the, the agenda. Short intro, I'm not sure if uh, everyone knows what uh, packet pacing is about. Then I'll start the overview, more uh, details on the main flow. And we will look at the kernel implementation. I want to actually look at the code that we put on the fabricator. Uh, it's only a base for changes. Uh, an important discussion was yesterday, and I magically missed it. And now Nuzdip is not here, so it's kind of funny. Uh, but uh, because it's the whole idea is that we need to have a, a general solution that can fit all. Uh, I, I have a slide about the design principles that led to th this current implementation, although that should change. Uh, and at the end, just a few pointers on the Mellanox driver highlights. Again, it, it helps explain stuff. Uh, and then open it for comments, and I think that might be the most important part of this uh, talk because my basic intention was that we can, we start to move the ball forward. We put the, the, our implementation fabricator, I think more than a year ago. We kind of paused it, and I think it's the time to go on. And the comments that I collected are uh, feasible. I think it's, uh, it shouldn't be that hard to have at last an implementation of this packet pacing on FreeBSD. Um, so a uh, short introduction. We're talking about uh, rate limiting TCP UDP socket based connections. Our implementation is mainly regard to TCP, but it's general enough to be UDP and even anything else. Uh, the characteristics is that we want to control the maximum bandwidth. We want to be able to set different rates to different flows. We want smooth and even distribution. The whole idea is that we can have minimal bursts sent to the network and thus avoid congestions in the network and thus prevent the TCP window resizing. So the, the general goal in mind, I'm coming from the vendor perspective of Mellanox, and I guess Chelsea shared the same goal, that we want to offload it and reduce the CPU overhead when we have the, soft, the software solution. Any questions up to here? So excuse my drawing skills, but I hope that once I start to explain it, it will become very clear. Uh, so we have the user space at top, we have the kernel, and we have the hardware. That's a, that's a card. Uh, so we start from the application. The application creates a socket, and let's say that it started transmitting traffic through that, let's say, TCP socket. And now the application wants to uh, start and uh, rate limit the traffic. So using a set sock opt with the value of rate limit, it's a 32-bit value, uh, um, unsigned integer. Uh, the application sets this value to the socket, and using a field that we now added to the socket, it now help holds the rate. Uh, that's it basically from uh, the socket. 
now in the IP output, so it's actually doing the fast, the fast pass. I'm, I'm describing how, how it all starts once the application is using the set socket to set a rate. So we change the field at the socket of the rate in the socket, which was uh, zero up till now, and now it holds uh, the requested rate, let's say three megabits per second. And now we're moving on to the fast pass, meaning that until we're transmitting any traffic, uh, then we, we don't actually even start, uh, start this flow. So inside IP output, we have an if for every packet, uh, which uh, detects when the rate changes. Once the rate changes, then it ioctals uh, the driver. I think it was discussed yesterday that maybe octal, IOCTAL won't be the way to go, but I think that uh, the basic will remain. IOCTAL presents the API that we want for this. In this case, we want an API for uh, creating uh, a new uh, rate limit queue. So the driver receives the IOCTAL and uh, immediately returns a TX ring ID synch synchronously. Uh, and this ring ID is now being inserted into the MBUF and then onto the driver. Uh, what the driver did when he got the IOCTAL is, like I said, return immediately the TX ring ID and afterwards created a thread so we can asynchronously create the requested TX ring with the requested rate limit. So uh, the first MBUF, as we said, contains the, the ring ID that he got. Let's say, I don't know, ring 17. He gets into the driver. The driver sees that this MBUF is a rate limit MBUF. That's the kind of traffic coming from a rate limit socket. So the driver wants to divert the packet to the, the ring ID queue. It's 17, so to queue number 17. So the first one and the X and buff afterwards until this operation is complete. We still don't have the queue, which uh, the rate limit queue, which uh, was created. So the driver diverts it to the standard uh, TX rings that the driver has. And so uh, the first X and buffs will not be rate limited, which is basically okay because it takes time to ramp up a connection. And this operation usually doesn't take so long. Once this operation ends and we have the queue ready, then all the MBUFs coming with this ring ID are diverted to this queue, and the hardware does the TX rate limitation. So you do this every time in IP output? Yes. Oh, next time uh, I, I come, I have, I see, uh, I have if to see if the rate changed. If it didn't change, but there is an if that we added, we'll see the code in a second, but there is an if we are adding to the IP output that needs to know if this is a rate limit uh, flow. If this is a limit a rate limit flow, it checks if the rate changed or the interface pointer changed. And if it didn't, it just takes the, the rate limit, the ring ID, which it already stores. It's where, being where is that stored? in the NPCB on this implementation. On, on an INPCB. So in goes, the NPCB, so yeah. It, it goes back in IP output and muddles with the INPCB. What do you mean by goes back? It, then? It, it, it has the INPCB. Uh, the IP output has the INPCB. Gets the INPCB. Yes. And stuff the rate in that. Yes, exactly. We'll see it in the code in a second, but yes, you're right. I, I put aside some details just to get the, the, the first flow, and, and my, the next slide will be just go into the code. I'll go through it uh, pretty briefly because a lot of it will change, but the basic uh, concept, I think, uh, will remain. So that's the price we're paying is adding this ifs. I think it's two or three ifs in the IP output. Uh, about the interface pointer, so uh, that's also a thing. Uh, a big problem with this implementation or with, with packet pacing that we want to do offload is that we want to connect hardware resources to the stack above. Uh, and once we have routing change and the hardware resources are directly connected to the interface, 
then in order to be able to deal with it, we need an interface pointer. So, um, like I said, on the, in the fast paths, we are trying to query every time if the interface pointer has changed. If it changed, then we will detach the ring ID from the old interface and attach uh, a new ring ID to the new interface. And that will be done for every flow that is seeing this, that the interface pointer has changed. So that, that's how we gain the flexibility regarding the interface. I will talk a little bit more about the interface uh, and the slides after the, the code that we're going to see. Any more questions before I remove this Mona Lisa? Okay, so code it is. Just a uh, copy paste from the fabricator. Uh, let's see if we can enlarge it. Is it okay now? Can you read it? Can do it even larger. Okay, so the first is all the ifconfig stuff because uh, we uh, added the uh, rate limit capability to the interface. I think that I just read uh, the comments that Navdeep posted with the, the discussion you did on transportation yesterday. Uh, so if we implement it as a function table in the interface, we might not need the capability. But again, we need a way to query if we support this feature or not. That's, that's the, base, the bottom line. It's not, I don't care how, but I think that uh, was the basic way to do it. Um, options for the kernel to be built with or without rate limit. We've left everything in the kernel, so we, we, we thought that it might be smart not to have the extra ifs if you don't want the, the rate limit option. Robert Watson was against it in his comments. He, was, he said that he wants to remove the if that. Okay, so now socket. We are in the UIPC socket.c. Uh, what we see here is that we added a socket option. And if we get this socket option to uh, set a rate, we get it as a 32-bit value. Uh, by the way, that we did that with the same name exactly as the socket options that Linux already have. Uh, just to have uh, the same uh, naming. Uh, once we get it, we store it inside the socket. So we added uh, a field called SO max spacing rate uh, to the socket. And that's it. We have the same for get sock opts. We added get sock opts. I might go into why we need get sock opt, but you can guess for yourself that we have a socket and one of the features that the socket have will be rate limit and the user or admin might want to query it. It's also a way to know if we actually did the set sock opt correctly because after some time, I'll get to that later, if the, the ring is not created, then we, uh, we zero this uh, field, and that's another way to know if the ring, uh, the hardware ring, was actually got created. <coughs> interface, that's the interface capability, and here that's the structure of uh, the request for TX rate limit. Uh, the basic thing that we need is this, the rate and ring ID in order to communicate regarding uh, our requests. And of course, this structure can change as long as that we have this. Uh, it's, it's very minimal to our implementation, but it might change. And interface.c, what we see here is that we uh, remove the capability to IOCTAL the, the driver from user space. So it will be only from inside the kernel code. And now to the tricky parts. In PCB, yep. For our implementation, it's a per flow. I'll discuss later why we went for this approach, you know, some uh, pre-allocation. But this uh, implementation should uh, support each approach. OK. 
because I know that Chelsea has a different of pre-allocating less rings, like you suggested, and having multiple flow per queue, and it shouldn't matter. I'll get to the numbers later. You mean how much do we support? Yeah. With queues, you can open millions of queues on, on our cards. But regarding rates, uh, so on our new cards, we will support about 500 different uh, rates. But you can attach to them, again, about a million queues. But we will limit it to a number, which will be around 100,000, uh, maybe more. Uh, that we think that with this number, we can still achieve line rate of 100 gigabits per second. So, but again, I have a slide for the basic numbers. So we were at the part of the NPCB, which is uh, a bit critical. We added uh, three fields uh, to the NPCB. It's the IFNet pointer, which of course will be discussed uh, in length after my session until we decide what to do with it, but that's uh, something that currently we think that we need it. Uh, and of course, the rate and the ring ID in order to put it to the MBUF and communicate with the driver the request to modify a rate, attach or detach. And here we see in the NPCB, we see the three functionalities which are now the basically the API for this feature, which is uh, modify a rate, which we already have, attach a new rate and detach a rate. And again, I thought that uh, regarding the discussion yesterday that it might be as, uh, as a uh, function table in the interface, but again, it doesn't matter where it is. It's just that these are, this is the basic functionalities that we now need. It might, of course, expand later. And here we have a get write lock. A function that we saw that we need in order to deal with the socket from the NPCB. And the reason is that we need it for that we don't know inside the TCP or UDP if we have a lock or not. In the case of TCP, we have a write lock. In case of UDP, we don't have a write lock. And we don't have any way to know that. That's why we added this function uh, with an exclusive, which means if we are the only one to have the write lock. I won't go, go into the logic. It's complicated enough that I will mix it up right now. but it's. It, the logic is uh, is clear once you get out, what, what, once you read it. But uh, I think Robert Watson wrote in uh, one of the comments that he prefers adding another parameter to all the IP output, TCP output functions. So he thinks that it's smarter to declare whether we have a lock or not all the way down, and not to have this complicated logic. Of course, that would would simplify. But again, it's another sensitive addition to the network stack. That's a problem with this feature because it deals with the very hardcore of the of our fast path in the network stack. So uh, I think maybe that's a phase two thing to discuss. Uh, in in PCB.c, uh, this is regarding I think the initialization of the NPCB. Oh, just move on, and here I will go briefly. Uh, over the three functions that we have, because it's pretty, it's pretty, lo it's pretty logical. So we have the modify. We have the, the new rate uh, as a parameter that we want to modify. So we take the write lock. We assert if the uh, if the ifnet pointer is is null. And then this is the request that we saw before, like that I mentioned that holds only the rate and ring ID. That's the only structure that I need in order to discuss this feature with the driver. Uh, so I set the new rate that I want for the driver. And I set the ring ID, which I already know that this is the ring ID because we are in a modify function. And then I, I octal the interface, which is stored in the in PCB. I octal it with the uh, I octal that we added to modify a rate. Uh, and if all is OK, then I change the rate that is stored in the NPCB to be now the new rate, and all is good. Uh, the attach function, that's when we have a new rate. So I have uh, a pointer to IFNet and the rate that I want for it, of course, the NPCB. 
same here. I need the right lock. And here it's the opposite. I assert if the interface pointer uh, is not null because it's, it's, uh, it's a new uh, rate. It doesn't suppose to be, to be exist. Um, so again, we have the structure of request. Now we need only the, the rate because the ring ID is still doesn't exist. That's what we're ioctaling for. We're ioctaling the interface that we got with the request. Sorry. First of all, we take a reference on the interface. That's an important uh, thing here. We hold a reference to the interface. And that's how we beat all the races we can have between the driver, which can be unloaded at any second, or the socket can be dropped. So as long as we are holding the reference, um, then we make sure that uh, such a race uh, will not occur in any panic. That's why if there is an error occurs, then we release it. I think that's a bug that uh, Drew you found <laughs> when you reviewed it. Uh, and then in the NPCB, of course, this means that the octal, the octal succeeded. So we stored the interface pointer, the new rate, and the rig ID. Because it was attached, now we have these three, three fields, which before that were uh, all zeroed. And the detach has, of course, a similar logic. Um, Uh, nothing important, just that once we're done, we need to uh, bring everything to default inside the uh, NPCB, and then we are ioctaling it. <coughs> Here there is an important comment. Uh, we, we, we heard in the, in, the, in the detach mode, so what he said, what happened if the, uh, the module was removed? So like I said, as long as we are holding a reference to the interface pointer, then the flow in the kernel protects us. So uh, ifdead is called. So all the callbacks are replaced with tabs. It's something nice that we found. I think that during the photo yesterday, it was mentioned that sometimes it's nice to see a code that is already there. So that was a very rare uh, instant that it happened. We tried to make a race to see the panic, and we couldn't. And then we found out that all the functions are replaced with tabs. So there is no problem to ioctal. Uh, the driver because it's being replaced with stuff. And then we release and the detach part is done. The get write lock, like I said, won't go into the logic, but uh, if it's a read lock, we need to upgrade, yada, yada, but that's uh, the, the basic is for it to make sure that we are holding the write lock on the socket before making changes. Uh, another uh, critical part is the IP output. Up till now, everything OK? Am I breezing through the code? Is it fast? Is it boring? OK. <clears throat> it's just important, I think, it's not long. It's pretty much, I think, uh, the end of it will be after IP output. But it's important to grasp uh, all the tricky points that this implementation holds. I'll try to discuss it a little bit later. And I hope that uh, in a very short discussion during the next few weeks, we will resolve everything and we'll get to a one final solution. So IP output. Um, so we take the, the, the rate. Uh, we take it from the, the socket. That's the place when we find out once it's changed from zero to anything else. And then we have uh, an if, which this if basically says, of course, checking for nulls, but this check is it checking if this is a rate limit flow or not. So as long as it's, this is a regular socket, not a rate limited socket, we will not go into this if. If it is a rate limited socket, we're going in. That's what it means. You see the capability. And if we have ring ID or a uh, rate, it means that it's a rate limit socket. So once we're in the, the flow of a rate limited socket, so like, like you see, it's two ifs uh, for traffic that is not rate limited that now are added to IP output uh, if you want to have this feature and not if deft in the kernel. Uh, so now that we are inside of this if, if you remember my drawing from before, we have two questions. We ask if the interface, if the IFNet pointer is changed 
or if the rate has changed. If the rate changed, uh, starting from, from this, because it's easy, then we are uh, calling the uh, modify function in the NPCB. If there is an error, then it's our uh, responsibility now to zero the field in the socket. Uh, because the socket immediately changes uh, the field in the socket, and the socket, of course, is not dealing with any ioctals. That's all happens once we start transmitting packets. Uh, and going back to the question, if the interface is changed, so if it's the first time that we uh, want to have a rate limit socket, then the interface change and it was first null, and now uh, so this means that the one in, in the NPCB was null, and the new and this is the new interface. So we take a right lock, uh, and here we're checking if the interface that we had is not null, meaning that this is uh, not a new rate limited socket. Then we need to detach the ring ID from the old interface because the routing now changed, and we need uh, in any case. Now we are doing attach for the new interface pointer with the rate. Of course, if error occurred, we are zeroing the max spacing rate. Uh, and if all is OK, then it's time to transmit the MBUF. And another tricky part is the MBUF. So here what we did is we abused the flow ID field because we didn't want to add any field to the MBUF. There was some discussion going on before that also Robert Watson and even Avdeep said that in some case we might want to add the field to the MBUF, but I think that yesterday uh, we might find, they might found a, a field where we can abuse a, a, a field in MBUF which is used only on the receive path, so we won't need uh, to change that as well. But basically the idea here is that we want the ring ID uh, in our case, insert it into an MBUF. I think in Chelsea's case, they need some kind of a cookie to tell where to steer the flow. To your question regarding if it's a multi-flow going into a queue, so it's a different kind of cookie, but it's a stamp that anyone should, I think, uh, use to uh, his own implementation. Uh, I don't think there is any contradiction here. So we added the hash type just to differentiate the flow ID field, which is basically supposed to be used for RSS. And here we've used it for something else because we didn't saw any use in the ticks. I think I explained enough about it because it will probably change. Uh, it's where we're doing it, but the idea stayed that we have the ring ID now in the MBUF going into the driver so the driver can immediately divert it to the rate limited packet. And thus uh, we, uh, uh, because we're doing it in that way, we don't need to add so much logic and holding all kinds of hash tables inside the driver, and we allow the performance to be maximum, which is the whole idea of this packet pacing, um, because we want it to be offload to the CPU. Uh, IP6, same thing, and here, of course, also the implementation should be modular into packets, because I think it's almost the same logic. The MBUF, that's the hash type that I told you that we added, the uh, setsoc option, the field inside the socket, and the three ioctals, which, which are the APIs, which might change instead of ioctals and be inside the, the function table of an interface. But that's the idea. Moving on, any questions regarding the code? Yes? We didn't measure it. It wasn't on the table. So. Nope. But, and regarding latency, like just logically, I mean, it's two ifs. So it shouldn't add uh, a latency. As I said, it will take some time before the packet will start rate limited. So maybe once it transmits, it might add. Yes, yes. That big rejection on that. I mean, that 
the, we, it's the next slide basically, or one afterwards, but basically uh, the, the logic here is that we wanna, we have to connect the, the upper parts of the network, such as sockets, to a hardware resource. Our first implementation was directly connect them, so the socket will know of a hardware ring ID, and, and we agreed that, that it's wrong because it's uh, too much knowledge for the socket on, on the little details. And again, if you start to think about stuff like routing change, then we need to enter the logic into the socket to handle and manage all the routing change. That's where we started having problem, and that's why uh, we thought that we need to know about the, the interface and I'll talk about VLAN and lag in a second just to mention it as, as a comment because it's something that it might expand to and why this design answers it all as a principle. Okay. It, it, there is no. no, 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 it would. It's, it, it depends on the implementation. Again, our implementation does uh, one per queue, but even on, in Chelsea case where you have a multi-connection like you want per queue, so it depends how you do the queue. If I believe what they have is a queue that knows the rate limit no matter how many connections it has or might be has a limitation. But you have 10 connection and it limits it to 10 megabits, then every connection will be limited to 10 megabits. It's not like that you need to calculate it somehow and right, so. Right, let's say I'm a user of LAN application and I want to bundle five connections into a 10 meg rate that you limit. What do you want with this connection? You want each connection to be limited to 10 megabit or are you saying, I don't care, I want all of them to be bundled all together to 10 megabits. And inside it, one can be zero and one can be 10, I don't care. So uh, in our case, we, we didn't go into such a scenario. So it's hard for me to answer more than that. And Yeah, a cookie for this type of flow. I mean, it's it's doable, but that's I think yeah, this design needs to change. I don't know. Maybe we need to think about it right now, and we can well, have all of it together. But that will be the, the simple case to this case, so I think it shouldn't be hard to solve it. I mean, I, I know the implement. How do you group the sockets? Like, you can't go Group all the. Uh, again, I don't know, because well, this scenario will be.
Yeah, I think it's easily doable. Like Drew commented, if we just uh, have and maybe add a parameter or something like that to, to be able to do grouping, saying that this ring ID is now in a grouping state and everyone that added to the group just uses the same tagging of ring IDs and the drive automatically directs all of them to the same queue. So it should work. I don't yeah, yeah, think I know, it's. Uh, but at that point, I'm, I'm hacking the front. Yeah. Again, this is. It, it depends on, on the needs, but it's adding another logical layer of grouping to, to the, the flows beneath it. So logically, it, yeah, I think it can be added. And it's important to understand that all of this implementation is, is new. We did some kind of an implementation with our previous card. We still didn't do it with our new card. That's why we want to revive all of this discussion and take these comments, and it might be a good point to influence it. Though what you're saying, I think it won't be so hard to do a phase two of it. But that's the state that you're seeing. That's why I'm saying this will change and that will change. That's like a basic implementation that we put on Fabricator. And I hope that now we, we can move forward again because I don't think that the rejections are, are so hard. Is that just a summary of the uh, sensitive parts that we changed? Um, do you need me to go over it really quick? Or because I think you kind of got the idea. Um, so the principle of this design uh, is one which we talked about is the, the fact that we, ha we, we got to have a logical connection between the socket at the, at the higher levels and the hardware resources because we want to do offload. And that's basically, I think, a, a new thing to FreeBSD. That's why we're having such a long discussion for it. I think Lawrence started it more than two years ago, three years ago, I don't know. So. Uh, but I think now we're there because we're seeing, I think it's not a trend. It's, uh, we, we want to offload everything. So um, I think because in Mellanox, uh, performance is, is our game. And everything we, we do, um, I think, with almost all of our customers is talking about offloads. We have a big project now. We have the open V switch, uh, if you're familiar with the virtual switch. Then everything, everybody talks now how to offload everything in, onto the cards. And all the vendors are trying to do it. So I think uh, it all points out that it's probably not a, a, a weird feature that we need to do some, somewhere, somewhere else. But that's the, uh, we need to find a decent solution that doesn't break all the FreeBSD principles. But we do need to do some uh, sensitive stuff uh, in the fast path. In, Yes, but oh, then so you'd have to double the code. yes, that that was the idea. I think we we did we wanted the general solution. That's what our architect did. So we have both, but yes. But you didn't want to use the yes because there was already some kind of uh, skeleton of upgrade. Yes. Yes, and, and, and I think we, we will change most of what we just saw in the NPCB because the API that will move probably into the interface function table and uh, the, the structure of fields, again, might move. So we need to be on it. Yes? Yes. Yes, yes. So... Current 
N not yet, but currently the responsibility with this implementation is still on the application to sense all the congestion and deal with it. If you don't. It's more flexible. Exactly. I think. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 I think you have something in the hand of the bank trust right away. Right? Or let the TCP do it. I think yeah. if if it it evolves into having a strong TCP engine, and let the TCP with its congestion window control the different rate, then you have your mechanism built in the TCP. I think that's. Yes. Yes, yes, I know about this. <laughs> uh, interface modularity and another uh, uh, a principle here is we want, like I did talk about it before, that I want to simplify the, the solution and not to have a lot of logic in the network. That's why I need the, the IFNet pointer. Uh, we gave the simple example of a routing change, so how, how can we handle that? And also, if we have VLAN and lag, it, it's also, uh, it connects pretty easily. So I hope you're seeing, but it's supposed to be si simple. If we have the, the socket, and we said that we have the, our interface pointer that we added, this interface pointer can be also VLAN. So if we are ioctaling this, uh, we use the ioctal or interface function uh, table, it doesn't matter. We're using it on the interface. The interface can be, it doesn't have to be straight up the, the, the driver interface. It can be a VLAN interface. And then all we need to do is just add a, the same logic into the VLAN, which is a simple logic, just to go ahead and, and, uh, and move this IOCTAL forward to the actual uh, driver interface, if it's a, if it's a VLAN. It, it, this interface can also be uh, a lag. And if it's a lag, then we need to, we already have some architecture that we saw that it is possible to deal in a case of lag. Then we need some logic in lag because a lag can hold uh, two driver interfaces. And, and, and then we, we must have some logic in the, in the lag, but again, it's, uh, it's transparent to the socket. So the socket, IOCTOS, the interface beneath it, and the interface can be anything. But then the lag needs to handle it with some tables that tells uh, if the resources are here or here, but somebody needs to know it, but, but it's solvable. So that's why we, uh, we think that, that that's the way to go. Uh, another uh, important principle in, in this implementation that we saw that it's dynamic because our end in mind is to support more than 100,000 connections, then we want to avoid pre-allocating all the connections and the overhead and buffers and uh, completion queues or whatever that is associated with every connection. And uh, let's see, it, we, we have the, not sure if we could keep dragging the DRBR, we might lose it. We have a buffer on, on the ConnectX3 implementation, a previous card. We started with, uh, our standard queue was uh, 1,024 building blocks. Each building block is 64 bytes, so it's 64 kilobytes. And this queue, we started with 128. By playing with it, we found out that 500 is a better number. So I think that's what we went for in, at the end. Not sure if we'll change it now. So it's something around the 32 kilobytes of the transmit buffer. Yes, yes. So the, the memory stamp is huge. That's why we don't want to start a driver with 100,000 times 32,000 kilobytes. It, it 
too much. And we talked about accuracy and flexibility, and during the discussion we thought that having this dynamic allocation gives you more flexibility for a lot of stuff. Um, so that's why we need specific flow information. I think Chelsea needs specific flow information, and they have something that is pre-allocated, so basically there is no way to not do it. It's just uh, the discussion is to where put this information and what the specifics of this information. But I think the design is starting to formalize. Uh, the, so our driver highlights. So we talk about capabilities. Uh, for our driver, it's TXRing per, uh, per rate limited uh, TCP flow. We talked about we can support millions of queues, and, and it works. We tested it with million queues. It, it doesn't matter, it's just a lot of overhead to handle so many resources. Uh, so that's why we got to the number around 100,000. Um, we also think it be, we, we have an implementation on our older card that we did, and we think about we just uh, need to uh, further uh, investigate and decide which interface, but on the sys controls, we already have uh, ways to manage the active rate limit values. In our implementation, uh, we'll see in, in a second, but you, you need to define a head, like the administrator, uh, all the different rates that he would like to use a head. So before doing the set of opt, you already need to uh, have the definition uh, for the rate limit. So the, the driver, the hardware uh, of the card will note the rate limit to this value, and then you can associate as many rings as you want to, to this rate limit value. Um, we have also the, the, in the sys control a way to query the, all the capabilities and limitation, of course, show statistics. You can see how many queues you have on each rate. And uh, for each queue, it's like a huge print. Once you have thousands, then it's, it, that's why we have all kinds of scripts to take it out to uh, Excel documents, because it becomes huge. But for each queue, you have how uh, many packets transmitted and stuff like that. Um, again, we're on the driver highlights. So uh, upon an IOCTAL, then the idea is not to break. Because we are uh, have to cross some layers to logically connect uh, the, the stack and the driver, then we're, trying, uh, we're keeping the fact that the driver will always return synchronously and do all the uh, asynchronously stuff, like all the creation and configuration uh, uh, at, at, the, at the background. And of course, on the fast pass, uh, we're matching the, the TX ring that we got from the NBUF and passing it to the queues. So that are the main changes to the driver to support it. Uh, some numbers, so we already have implementation on our Connect X3 card, so we have up to 45,000. and. It, we can make it configurable, like uh, with a tunable, but we limited it just to a number that we uh, think that with the burst that we have will support uh, line rate. And for the ConnectX4, it should be 100,000, might be more. Uh, on ConnectX3, we, have, we support 120 different rate limit values per port, and the ConnectX4, it will be around 500. Um, on ConnectX3, we support uh, the rate limit values will be from 250 kilobit per second up to 50 megabits. It will expand on ConnectX4, and the, granul the granularity will be, I think, about uh, 25, uh, 250 kilobits for, for every rate. So you can say 250, 500, 750, 1 megabit, etc. cetera. Um, and burst side, that's also an important parameter. So on the ConnectX3, which is impl impl implementation that we already have, uh, we found two magic numbers for a low burst and a high burst. The low burst is three packets, which basically is four uh, kilobits, but then it, it, it being translated to packets. So it, it will be usually three packets, sometimes two packets. And the high burst will be a five or six packets every time. So in Connecting Street, to achieve a uh, line rate with so many connections, we needed the high burst. Um, but we can assure that it won't be uh, any more than six packets. 
more comments, more questions. The first thing that Lawrence did, he didn't even want to use the, the, the sets of cops uh, interface. It was just the easiest way for us to show this feature. But immediately started writing code into the TCP stack and to set everything from there according to stuff that he gets. So it's just the interface. But yeah, the octals are there. The end in mind will be, I mean, you're right. The end in mind, I think, we, we knew it from the beginning, will not end in a set of cop to an application. It's nice, but it will be a much, uh, much stronger feature if it can be used by the TCP. So we can control its congestion window, and you won't see the window go up, and then breaks into half and half and half, and then, you know. What do you mean? Uh, I'm trying to remember with our testing, but we tested like thousands of changes per second, and it was not a problem. I'm trying to think if there is any limitation that it might hurt us, because basically when you change it at least through the sets of cop, it doesn't matter. You just change a field in the socket, and then you start the fast path. And the IP output start octals, and then it just depends on the driver. So changing a rate, it's easy. If now it's a lot of new rate limits or a burst of it, so it might take the driver a long time to create everything. I know that uh, detaching, like at the end, closing 45,000 on, the, on the, the, our old cards, that took a lot of seconds when you like, destroy the driver. I don't know. I didn't test it against them. You know. It's hard to test it. Like in our environment in the lab, we need a lot of receivers to get line rate with so many connections. Anything else? Thanks.